ready for the word? Good. Well, we are starting a brand new series today, and I am so excited about it. We're doing a book study, and we're going to jump into the book of Romans. And uh, I'm excited because I've been wanting to do a book study for quite a while, but I'm also excited because Romans is my favorite New Testament book. Uh, as a matter of fact, there are quite a few theologians that argue that Romans is perhaps the most important book in the entire Bible. So if you've never read through Romans, studied Romans, buckle up. It's going to be fun. It's going to be exciting. But don't just take my word for it. Uh, like I said, some of the greatest Christian minds throughout history have put Romans uh, in a category all its own. There's a guy named Martin Luther. Perhaps you've heard of him. He said this, Romans is the chief part of the New Testament and it's the perfect gospel. Uh, John Calvin, the famous reformer, he said this, when anyone understands this epistle, Romans, they have an open door to all the most profound treasures in scripture. Uh, Frederick Godet, a famous Swiss theologian, he said it like this, Romans is the cathedral of the Christian faith. So for the next three months as a church, we're going to go through the book of Romans. And uh, frankly, three months is not enough time. Uh, I wish we could spend six months going through this amazing book. But we're going to go chapter by chapter. Uh, but then sort of in addition to that, uh, what you'll find is that Romans has three kind of main themes. In the first part of Romans, uh, it talks about truth. In the middle part of Romans, it talks a lot about faith and freedom. And then the last part of Romans talks about life. So as we spend three months going through Romans, those are sort of going to be the sub-themes that we will weave together in our messages. And uh, I'm just so excited about this theme. And then, of course, in addition to all this, uh, just because we love you, uh, we are doing something special on Wednesday nights. On Wednesday nights online, we do a thing called Unpacked, uh, where some of our team get together and we unpack what happened on the weekend. We talk in detail and in practicality about the message because we can never cover everything that we want to say on a Sunday. But this, this next couple months as we go through Romans, we're not just doing Unpacked. We're going to do Unpack and Prepare. So we're going to spend some time as well getting us ready for the next chapter of Romans that we're going to cover the following week. Does that make sense? Everybody good with that? I hope so. All right, let's jump into Romans chapter one. God, I pray you give me boldness. I pray you give me clarity and I pray you anoint me to preach your word this morning. All right, Romans chapter one. Just a little bit of context before we, we read. Um, more than perhaps any other New Testament letter, Romans is rich in sound doctrine. And that's a topic that's incredibly important uh, for us in the time and in the season of this world. Paul, who is our author, um, in another New Testament passage, would prophetically write to his young protege in the faith, Timothy, and he would say this, there will come a time where people will not want to hear sound doctrine. They'll have itching ears and turn from truth to fables. Friend, we are living in that time. Just look around. It won't take you long and you will see that it seems the world has gone crazy on a multiplicity of fronts. And for those of us that call Jesus Lord, for those of us that anchor our lives uh, to a biblical worldview, it's shocking to see how far society has drifted from what was once held precious in terms of morality and faith. And this is why sound doctrine, this is why the book of Romans is so incredibly important because here we see the intersection of Christianity and culture. And friend, if we're going to live unashamedly for Jesus in the midst of a crooked and a perverse generation, we need help. We need a guide. We, we need a map. And I believe that through the power and through the revelation of the Holy Spirit, Romans can be that guide for us. So buckle up, get ready. Let's jump in here. A little bit of context. Romans, it's a letter written by the Apostle Paul, and it's written to a group of believers living in the city of Rome. Uh, one of the things that sets this New Testament letter apart from all the other Pauline epistles, all the other Pauline letters, is that Paul is writing to a church that he's never seen. He's never been there in the flesh. He wasn't a part of setting it up. He wasn't a part of getting this church established. And now he's writing to them in anticipation of visiting them for the first time. And history tells us that this church in Rome, it was a very diverse community, a diverse congregation. Uh, it consisted of both Jews and Gentiles, uh, with Gentiles being in the majority. History also tells us that there was considerable conflict between these groups, both from an ethnic and from a theological perspective. So I want you to sort of get the picture here as we get ready to read. 
within this church, race, culture, and belief systems were all the hot button topics of the day. I wonder if that sounds familiar to anybody else. So Paul, in anticipation of his first visit, uh, visit uh, he, he writes as a bit of a peacemaker. And it's interesting because Paul is uniquely qualified for this role because he has a foot in each camp. Right, let's remember Paul on, on the one hand is unashamedly and, and quite patriotically Jewish, but then on the other hand, he has been specially commissioned and sent by God to be an apostle to the Gentiles. So he writes from this really unique position of being able to bring reconciliation. As you read through Romans, what you will see is that Paul seeks unity amongst the body. He, he seeks to remind everyone that no matter where you come from, no matter what your background is, we all stand together under the same blood-soaked banner of Jesus Christ. With that in mind, we begin to read Romans chapter one, verse number one. Paul, he starts with an introduction. He says this, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle. Just, just pause there for a moment. Notice the two descriptors Paul uses. He says, servant and apostle. And by calling himself a servant, first and foremost, he's letting his readers know that he's a believer, that he's a Christian, that he's put his faith in Christ. You see that term servant uh, is a general Christian term. For those of us that believe in Jesus, have put our trust in Jesus, we see him as Lord, therefore we are his servants, but servant is also a title of great humility. And it expresses Paul's genuine sense of, of insignificance uh, aside from belonging to Christ Jesus. But then he also uses the, the title apostle, and that word means sent one. And this is a title that speaks to him being directly and personally called and commissioned by Jesus, sent out into the world to preach with Jesus' authority. And as we finish verse number one, we see that Paul, servant and apostle, says he's been set apart for the gospel of God. Now, many of you would know this, but that word gospel, it means good news. And for Paul, the good news is this. It's the gospel of God. The reason he calls it the gospel of God or the good news of God is because God is the author of this good news. And I want you to notice something. The gospel is not something that people invented. It's not something that the apostles of Jesus invented. No, the gospel was revealed to the apostles and it was entrusted to them by God himself. So, so, so hear me, the gospel, which we're gonna dive into in just a moment, it's not a subject of human speculation. The gospel, it's not just another world religion that we add onto the ever-growing pile. No, the gospel is God's own good news for a lost and a dying world. Verse number two which God promised beforehand, speaking of the gospel, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son. And what Paul is getting at here is that the gospel is not just something that God revealed to the apostles, but that the gospel is also something that's revealed and promised throughout the Old Testament Scriptures. You'll remember this story, but Jesus in Matthew chapter five, there in the New Testament, he's speaking to some religious leaders of his day, and he says to them, look, you search the scriptures, and he's referring to the Old Testament scriptures. You search the scriptures, because in them you think you'll find eternal life, but he says those scriptures, the Old Testament, it points to me, it bears witness of me. And the apostle Paul, in his writing here in Romans, is saying that, look, hey, both the apostles and the Old Testament scriptures, they attest to the gospel. They attest to the good news of God, and the good news of God to a lost world is Jesus. That's the message that Paul has been commissioned to preach around the world, that Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that on the third day, God the Father, through the power of the Holy Spirit, raised him back to life, and now through the resurrection and through the finished work of Jesus on the cross, we have forgiveness of sins, we've been made the righteousness of God, and we've been given eternal life. That is the gospel, and Paul has been commissioned to preach this gospel, and the church at Rome, they believe this gospel, and they live it out wholeheartedly in their lives, so much so that when we get to verse eight, Paul says this, your faith, referring to the church, your faith is proclaimed in all the world. Again, Paul's never even been to this church. He's never seen the people in this congregation, but he's heard a lot about them. He's heard about their faith. And over the next couple of verses, verses nine and 10, he lets them know that he's been thinking about them. He lets them know that he's been praying for them and praying specifically that he might come and visit them. And as I read that, I began to ask myself the question, well, does Paul really need to go and visit this church? 
right? Because it's obvious they're already living in obedience to God's word, that they're living from a place of, of genuine faith. Can't Paul just sort of pray for the church from afar? Well, Paul answers the question. He, he explains to us why he's so eager to visit. Look at verse number 11, Romans 1 and verse 11. Paul says, for I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. Drop down to verse 15. So I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. So Paul gives us two reasons here why he's eagerly awaiting his visit. First, because as a preacher, as an apostle, Paul wants to use his God-given ability to encourage the people in their faith. But then secondly, Paul says he also wants to visit because he can be encouraged by their faith. So there's this mutual exchange. I want to encourage you and I want to be encouraged by you. Now as a pastor, I read that and I love that. I totally get on with that because hear me, there's something that happens supernaturally when people gather together around the word of God, there's a spiritual exchange that takes place. I stand up here today and I preach the word to you and I believe that as the word is preached, as we gather around God's word, something supernatural happens. There's an exchange where faith comes from me and goes towards you via the word of God. But then having said that, something happens mutually, that as we gather around God's word, as you receive God's word being preached, your faith and encouragement gets transplanted into me, again, via the the word of God. This is why we are instructed in the book of Hebrews. We are not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Something happens when believers get together in the same space around the word of God. Listen, online church is great. It's a useful tool. If you can't be here on a Sunday or maybe you're out of state, out of country and you tune in, that's wonderful. But listen, if you're in the area, you need to be in church because something happens when people gather together around God's word. I'm telling you, the gospel, it's supernatural. Paul says as much. Look at verse 16 and verse 17. And by the way, these next two verses are perhaps the most important verses in the entire book of Romans. They frame for us the rest of the letter. Verse 16, Paul says this, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Listen, the, the gospel, the good news about what Jesus has done for us, this is not a new age, moralistic, find yourself, become a better version of you type of message. On the contrary, the gospel is supernatural. And just like the apostle Paul said, I want to echo as your pastor, I am not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed to preach the message of Jesus. And I know that in the world we live in today, the gospel message is not popular. I know it's not new, I know it's not cool, I know it's not in vogue. I know the message of the gospel is not readily accepted. I know that by most standards, it's not even politically correct, but that's not the point. The point of the message of the gospel is that it's supernatural. And when it's preached and when it's received and when it's believed, the power of God goes to work in people's lives. Notice what Paul says. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God for salvation. Now that word power in the Greek, it's the word dynamis. It's where we get our English word dynamite. The gospel is God's dynamite for salvation. Think, think about it like this. My boys, their favorite show is a show called Duck Dynasty. As I can tell, many of you have seen it before. And my boys have this habit of watching their favorite episodes over and over and over. And I know which one is their favorite because I've seen it the most times. Matter of fact, I've seen it the most times. It's the episode where uh, Phil and Uncle Cy have to go out and take care of a beaver dam. A beaver dam gets built on their property and it stops the flow of water from the stream into their pond and so they go out and they take care of this beaver dam and they do it in a very southern way. They fill that beaver dam up with dynamite. <laughs> they light that fuse and the beaver dam 
is no more. Now, I want you to just kind of keep that image in your mind for a moment, and I want to apply it to the verse we've just read. Paul says that the gospel is the power, is the dynamite of God to blow up the sin and the junk and the addiction and the general, uh, generational curses in our lives that have been damming up what God has in store for us. Listen, I I'm telling you, the gospel, it's, it's power. It's supernatural. It's how God brings salvation. But also, verse 17 says, the gospel, for in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. And by saying from faith to faith or from faith for faith, Paul is simply saying that righteousness is received through faith and only by faith. In other words, we didn't become righteous through our own doing, through our own merit, or through our personal goodness. He says we've received righteousness when we put our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ. And now that we've received that righteousness by faith, we don't have to earn it anymore through personal goodness. No, it is maintained through faith. It came by faith and it's maintained by faith. This is why the Apostle Paul ends verse 17 by quoting the Old Testament scripture, Habakkuk 2 and 4. He says, the righteous shall live by faith. You've got to catch this. We receive righteousness by faith and we live in righteousness by faith. Is this making sense? Are you understanding what Paul's getting at here? All right, let's move down into the next section of verses verses 18 through 32, and what we're about to read, frankly, are difficult verses. But yet these verses are incredibly important and incredibly relevant for our lives. They shine a spotlight onto our current reality. And the message that Paul is gonna communicate in this last section of verses is that the gospel enters into bad places. The gospel enters into bad places. Friend, that's good news. But what we're also gonna see in this section of verses is that there's some bad news. The bad news is this, we're all sinners. That outside of Christ, not one of us is righteous. Not one of us has an excuse. Paul's gonna let us know that we all need saving, that we all need a savior, that we all need the power of the gospel in our life. And when it comes to the gospel, when it comes to its declaration about sin, what we're about to see is that we are all on equal footing. Let me maybe say it like this, and this might offend somebody. No one is a victim. We are all villains. We need to keep that in mind as we read this. None of us are victims. We are all the bad guy. We are all villains. We were born into sin. We were born into this villainhood. We came out of the womb expert sinners. If you don't believe me, look at your children. Someone goes, well, my, my mom said I have a good heart. Well, she lied to you. <laughs> to quote Romans chapter three, none of us are good. None of us are righteous. No, not one. And in these verses, Paul's gonna let us know that our natural state is far worse than we could ever imagine. He's about to lay out the depravity of mankind. He's gonna use terms like dishonorable in our passions and in our desires. He's gonna refer to our debased minds. Really what Paul is saying is that the heart of the problem is that there's a heart problem and that the gospel is the only cure. And again, just a word of warning. A word of warning. What we're about to read is gonna cut some of you sideways, especially young people. And I love young people. I was a youth pastor for a decade. I love young people. But listen, what we're about to read, young person, is gonna fly in the face of what you're learning in school and what you're learning on social media. And as we read these verses, I promise you, some of you will be offended. But before you get offended, just remember, these verses, they're all inclusive. We're all the villains here, preacher included, okay? We're all in the same boat together, and because we're all in the same boat, and because I am an equal opportunity offender, in other words, I like to offend everybody equally, I've put together a little mantra for us to say. 
as we read these verses and perhaps we feel offense coming up in our spirit, I, I, I've prepared a little mantra that we can say aloud to ourselves just to get us back on the right page. They're gonna throw it up on the screen. Maybe we could say it together. I'm wrong, God is right. So as we read through these verses and we don't like what we read, remember the mantra, I'm wrong, God is right. Let's read. Verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Notice that word all. The wrath of God is revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Again, we are all in the same boat. We all need saving from the wrath of God. Why do we need saving from the wrath of God? Because God is holy and his righteous wrath is poured out on sin. If not for the grace, if not for the mercy, if not for the cross of Jesus, where would we be? Christian, hear me. Never forget where you came from. Never forget that you were stuck in the miry clay of sin and that you were pulled out. You were rescued. And as we remember that, what it means is that we never have an excuse to look down our nose at somebody else because you can't look down at somebody else and up at the cross of Christ at the same time. In this verse, Paul, Paul also mentions the wrath of God. And I want you to just keep that term in mind. We're gonna come back to it in just a minute, but I wanna keep reading verse 19. Paul says this, for what can be known about God is plain to them because God's shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and his divine nature, they've clearly been perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that he, that he made, in the things that have been made. So they, people, are without excuse. So quickly, Paul here, he's talking about how God has revealed himself and revealed the truth of his nature to all men. To all men. Therefore, there's no excuse. In other words, you're gonna stand before God one day there's gonna be a judgment, and no man is gonna have the excuse. No man's gonna be able to say to God, well, God, I didn't know. Paul says, according to this verse, that God has revealed himself in a couple of ways. One, through an internal law, and then two, through a natural law. The internal law, God has put a conscience on the inside of each and every one of us. Innately, we know the difference between right and wrong. Right, think about the garden, think about Adam and Eve. They disobey God, they step out from under his authority. They realize something is wrong. They made a bad decision. What do we see them doing? They run and they hide. It's a human's natural reaction to hide when they've done something wrong. Think about our kids. Before they ever learn what's right and what's wrong, they know. My five-year-old Clay was here in the first service. When he was two years old, he got into our cabinet and he stole a chocolate bar and he ate the whole thing. And we found the wrapper, but we couldn't find clay. You know why? Because he knew he had done something wrong and he went into hiding. And what Paul is saying is God has put an internal sense on the inside of us, a sense of right and wrong, a sense of justice. And we have this knowing that there is a divine judge that determines what's right and what's wrong. But he says also there's a natural law that God's invisible attributes, his nature is revealed in creation. It's revealed in science and how the universe is set up and how it functions. It points to a divine design. So in short, what Paul is saying is, look, you can know the justice of God through your conscience and you can know the power of God through creation, but you can only know the love and the truth of God through Jesus. Verse 21, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Paul slightly shifts his focus here. Now he turns his attention toward explaining what happens when a society, not just an individual, but when a society, a group of people turn from God. Look back at verse 21. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Let's break this down for a moment. This is important. That word knew, um, 
It talks of a general understanding. It talks of a, a general knowing, a, a general knowledge of something here. I, I want you to see the picture Paul, Paul's painting. He, he's talking about a society that previously possessed a general knowledge or understanding of God, that, that had a general God-fearing attitude. Now, this doesn't mean everybody in society was a Bible-believing Christian, but rather he's describing a society that, that on the whole at least recognized and acknowledged the blessing of God upon them and upon their nation. And then also notice this word knew, it's in the past tense. Not know, not knowing, but a group of people that, that knew. He's speaking of a society that at one point had, but now has lost a sense of acknowledgement and dependence upon God. I wonder if that sounds familiar. I wonder if that sounds like a country we might be living in. Listen, right now we live in a society that has arrived at the conclusion that the acknowledgement of God is out of fashion and it is invalid. And this path away from God, what it does is it triggers a spiritual and a moral wandering that moves people further and further and further from the truth. And Paul goes on to describe the consequence of this type of action. He says they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. That word futile, it means to ruin something. It depicts something that is error-filled. They became futile, error-filled in their thinking. Thinking, it refers to a person's reasoning, to their mental process, to their calculations. And Paul's painting a very clear picture here of what happens when society sets aside God. What happens is error gets released, leading to ruin on multiple levels. Let me maybe say it like this. In the book of Proverbs chapter one, we read that the fear of God, the acknowledgement of God is the beginning of all wisdom. So if society accepts and if a society acknowledges God, it results in enlightenment, it results in knowledge. But if that's true, the opposite is also true. That when the fear and the knowledge of God is diminished in society, it actually produces an environment where intellectual nonsense runs rampant, where eventually error begins to spill into every sphere of society leading to futile thinking. And this is what Paul says has happened. They've become futile in their thinking, but also their foolish hearts became darkened. That word foolish means a loss of or a lack of intelligence. And Paul is saying that when society turns away from God, rather than getting smarter, society will regress and become more and more foolish in their reasoning and in their thinking process. He said their foolish hearts, their hearts became darkened. He's using this word to paint a picture. He's talking about the human heart here. The human heart and its function within the body as it pumps blood through the circulatory system. And it's depicting what happens when the heart of society becomes darkened. You see, when society moves away from God, its heart begins to fill with foolishness. And just like that human heart pumps blood into every part of the body, the heart of a wayward society will begin to pump foolishness and flawed thinking throughout its circulatory system until every pillar in society gets filled with the destructive effects of that foolishness leading to depravity, immorality, and ungodly behaviors. Again, I want you to catch what I'm saying here. So I'm gonna repeat something I said earlier. The heart of the problem is that there's a problem of the heart. And the problem of the heart is this. We like to set ourselves up as kings of our own kingdom. We like to see ourselves as wise in our own eyes. As a matter of fact, verse 22, Paul calls this out. He says, claiming to be wise, they became fools. Paul says that when the leaders of this wayward society and those that go along with this type of living, those that go along with this type of thinking and believing, they'll call themselves wise. They'll assert themselves as the standard bearers of society. But God calls them fools because they exchange the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, birds and animals and creeping things. Let me maybe say it like this. Society may have stopped worshiping God, but society has not stopped worshiping. We just changed the object of our worship. And this is what the scriptures call idolatry. 
And someone goes, well, that, that seems sort of ridiculous that in our day and that in our time, anybody would bow down and worship a man, a bird, or an animal, right? Like it, it does, it sounds sort of ridiculous, yet we do it all the time. We love to worship men. We idolize and we worship politicians and athletes and musicians and social media influencers and boyfriends and girlfriends. We worship men all the time. Okay, well, I can get on board with that, but, but animals and birds, that, that's weird. People don't worship that. Really? We do it every Sunday. The Rams and <laughs> the Seahawks, the Eagles, the Bears. The greater point's this. We're all created to worship. We were created to worship the creator, yet because of sin, we have this tendency to worship created stuff over the sovereign creator. Look at what happens next, verse 24. Therefore God gave them up. Therefore God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies amongst themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and they worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator, who's blessed forever, amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For this reason, God gave them up. Well, what's the reason that God gave them up or poured out his wrath? The reason is because we chose to worship and we choose to worship the creature over the creator because we exchange the glory of the immortal God for what I want. God says, for this reason, he gave them up. What does that mean? It means he released them. He gave them up. And we have to connect that statement to the statement about pouring out of God's wrath that we saw in verse number 18. So let's put this all together. What, what does it look like? What does it mean that God gave them up? What does it look like for God to pour out his wrath on the unjust? What, how does he do that in our lives? Well, according to these verses, simply said, God's wrath in our lives is when he gives us what we want. When he gives us what we want. When we desire to be God in our own lives and we want to be left to do what we want to do, when we would say, look, God, I don't need you. I know better than you. Your ways are outdated. Your ways are out of touch. I know better. God's wrath is to say, okay, do it your way. I think about it like this. I've got three boys, 12, 10, and five. And they're active boys and they love to play outside but I've made a rule that they can't play in the front yard without me. And it's not because I wanna be a killjoy. I, I want them to get their exercise. I want them to have fun. I want them to play. But we happen to live on a very busy street. And I've been out there before with them and I've seen balls and Frisbees end up in the midst of this very busy street. As a matter of fact, one time they threw a Frisbee and it hit a car as it was moving. It was really embarrassing. So I've created a rule. I said, guys, look, unless I am out here with you, you cannot play in the front yard. And sometimes my 12 year old looks at me like I'm crazy. He goes, dad, dad, I'm fine. Dad, dad, we'll be fine. I'll watch them. Dad, I've got this under control. Dad, I know better. I've got this under control. To which I say, look, the, the reason I don't let you play out there is not because I don't love you. Look, if I didn't love you, I'd say, go ahead, go play in the street. And they may see my love as restricting, they may see it as offensive, they may see it as controlling, but nonetheless, it's love. And whether, the, whether or not they can see it, my love has their best interests at heart and it's there to guard them, it's there to protect them. Are you understanding what I'm saying here? So God's wrath in our life is when he removes his protective hand and says, okay, do what you wanna do. And he allows us to worship what we wanna worship. And over the next few verses, Paul begins to list out some of the things that we oftentimes choose to worship over God. And we're gonna get into this list, but let me just give you a warning before we do. If we're not careful, our tendency will be to look at this list and to attach to it varying levels of seriousness. We like to do that with our list. We like to create hierarchies, if you will. We look at a list of sin and we go, oh, well, this one's worse than that one. So this one goes down here and that one I'm gonna put up, up there. Now there's a problem with doing that and it's a big problem. And the problem is the scriptures. <laughs> because spoiler alert, we're gonna get there in two weeks, chapter three. Um, the Bible says that we all 
have sinned and we've all fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible says that the wages of all sin is death and that the whole world stands guilty before a holy God. In other words, we may make our list of what we think our sins are bad or worse, not so bad, red light sin, yellow light sin, green light sin, but to God, he doesn't make lists. To him, all sin is wrong and to him, all sin leads to death and all of us are on that guilty list. Someone goes, I don't like that. So I, 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 don't, I don't think that's right, right? That, that's offensive. Could we just consider for a moment that maybe, just maybe, God is the one that's offended? And that we're all the perpetrators? And because of that, because we're all guilty, what it means is that if you use this list that we're about to read to single somebody out, you're doing it wrong. Because the word of God was never meant to be used as binoculars to look at somebody else. The word of God is a mirror and it reflects to us our actual state of being and our own guilt before a holy God. So be warned, let's go. Verse 24. Therefore God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies amongst themselves. Paul starts the sin list here, the things that we choose to worship over God, and he starts with sex outside of marriage. As humans, we have this tendency to worship sex and to chase a feeling that at the end of the day, if we're honest, when it's done outside of the confines of marriage, it doesn't even end up fulfilling. But Paul starts the list here, sex outside of marriage, and he calls it wrong. God calls it wrong. As a matter of fact, God calls it impure and dishonoring. We see that there in the verse. And then we get to verses 26 and 27. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up their natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. Now, I get asked about this one a lot especially in the day and the age that we're living. I get asked a lot by young people in our church and in our community. I get asked about same-sex attraction, homosexuality, the LGBT community. They go, hey, what do you think about blank? To which my response often is, look, what, what I think, it doesn't really matter because that's just my opinion. The real question is, what does the Bible say about blank? And then what do you feel about the Bible? Listen, each of, us, each of us has to make a determination. Is the Bible my final authority? Or am I my own final authority? And how we answer that question will determine the stance that we take and how we live our lives. We have to determine, is God true? Or am I my own truth? And I just want you to know that for me, for my family, for this church, I choose God's word as our final authority. Not, not popular opinion, not social media, not academia, not culture, not my emotions, not my desires, not my passions, not my attractions. No, it's God and his word. They are my final authority. And never forget, again, we're all on equal footing. Jesus said, if anyone, if anyone desires to come after me, they have to do the same thing. They have to deny themselves, their wants, their desires, their passions. They have to deny themselves, pick up their cross, and follow me. Listen, you can't follow Jesus and be your own final authority because he's either king of all or he's not king at all. And when it comes to the Bible and what it says about sex and sexuality, it says this, that it's for married people. Not for going to be married people. <laughs> Not for used to be married people. Not for people that say, well, we're married in our hearts. That's <laughs> for married people. And the Bible says marriage is for one man and one woman in one covenant for one lifetime. And anything outside of that Anything outside of that, according to the scriptures, it's called sexual immorality. And someone goes, well, well, you know, according to that list, you know, I don't 
don't make the cut. Am I or is my family member, is my friend, are we welcome in this church? Yes. Absolutely, you are welcome here. You're loved here because we realize we're all on a journey together. We're learning what it is to deny ourselves, pick up our cross, and follow Jesus. We're learning what it looks like to keep our eyes on Jesus together. We're learning what it looks like to find our identity in Christ. So yes, 100%, you are welcome here. Listen, if we were ever to disallow sinners from coming to church, there'd be nobody here to do church, (laughs) including the preacher. Listen, we're not a perfect church. And if we were, the moment you walked in, we stopped being perfect, all right? Like, <laughs> we're not a perfect church. We don't claim to be a perfect church. But we serve a perfect Savior. And Jesus is and will always be the only superstar around here. <laughs> but having said that, you need to know this about us that the word of God will always be our final authority. We'll do our very best to speak the truth in love, but listen, we will not do hermeneutical gymnastics to try and make the word say something that it doesn't say, okay? We've got to finish, let's finish up this list. Verse 28, verse 28, most of these are self-explanatory. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness. And then here's the list. Evil, covetousness, which is a simple way of saying, God, look, I should have this, not that. You did it wrong. Covetousness, malice. They're full of envy, murder. Someone goes, ooh, that's a harsh one. Well, according to Matthew chapter five, as we get into the New Testament, Murder is not just about the physical act anymore. Jesus says murder is a matter of the heart. That if you get angry with your brother and you curse your brother, you're guilty of murder. The list continues, strife, deceit. Listen, if at some point this week you pulled up on your phone in that little box that says, I agree to above terms, I have read and agree, and you click that box, you're guilty according to this list. Maliciousness, the gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, means rude, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, meaning they lack empathy or compassion for their neighbor, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. It's a pretty heavy list. And it's pretty all-inclusive. It's a catch-all. You'll notice Paul uses the word they or them quite a few times. Eight times to be exact. And the reason for that, the reason he uses they and them is because the they and them is us. We are all lawbreakers. And I want you to look at this list, look at this law and think about it like an x-ray, right? It, It reveals the problem. We look at this list, we realize something is broken. We realize something is off. But this law, this list, just like an x-ray, it has no power in and of itself to fix the problem. Why? Because as I've said a couple times today, the heart of the problem is that we have a heart problem. We all need to be saved. We all need to be healed through a power that is not of our own making. And here's the good news, that power is available. That power is called the gospel. And the gospel has been preached today. And the gospel is available for you today. The good news that even though we're lawbreakers, the good news that even though we stand guilty before a holy God, there's an answer, there's a cure, there's a savior. And his name is Jesus. And if you'll put your trust in Jesus, you'll find life. If you put your trust in Jesus, you'll find forgiveness. If you put your trust in Jesus, you'll find wholeness, healing. If you put your trust in Jesus, you'll find a peace that your weary mind has been longing for. 
to find hope. Listen, any hope outside of Jesus is no hope at all. And if you don't know him, if you've never accepted the good news that God sent his only son into the world, that while we were still sinners, Jesus died for us. If you've not accepted that news, if you've not believed it in your heart and grabbed a hold of the promise by faith, the power of God is here. It's available for you. Some people go, well, let me, let me, let me fix this. Let me get my life in order. Let me get my ducks in a row. Let me get rid of some of the baggage and then I'll come to, that's not how this works. You are not made righteous. You're not made right with God via your works. As a matter of fact, the Bible's pretty clear. It says that even on your best day, your good works are like filthy rags. But the Bible also says, though your sins be like scarlet, there's an agent that can wash you as white as snow. And that agent, his name is Jesus. That agent is his blood that was shed on the cross for you. He died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried, but on the third day, God the Father, by the power of the Holy Spirit, raised him back to life. And if we'll put our trust in what he's done for us, not in what we can do for ourselves, but when we put our trust in what he's done for us, that's when we enter into this relationship called salvation. And Jesus didn't just die on the cross to forgive us of our sins. I'm grateful that he did, but that's only half the gospel. The other half is this. We now become the righteousness of God in Jesus. That when God the Father looks at us, remember, God is judged. When he looks at us, he doesn't see fault. He doesn't see mistake. No, he sees us now through the filter of his son. He sees his own righteousness. We are accepted and we are approved in the beloved. We're not welcomed because of our merit. We are welcomed because of Jesus. We've been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And if you don't know him today, if you've never accepted him as Lord and as Savior, if you've never experienced salvation, I want to pray for you. Would you mind just bowing your heads with me for a moment? Father, you know every life, every story. You know every scene, every situation, and every scenario. And I thank you that as your word's been preached today, your Holy Spirit has been active upon each heart. And God, for those that don't know you, I pray that even now you're stirring them towards you, that your goodness and your kindness is leading them toward repentance. Father, for those in the room that need a new start, God, those in the room that are weighed down by this list, this list of sin, the things that we've chosen to worship, Oh God, I pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would point them to your son, Jesus. That you would point them to Jesus. That as they cry out to you for help, as they cry out to you for salvation, you would meet them right where they're at, right in their point of need. That you'd wash them. Wash them in your precious blood, oh Jesus. Give them eternal life. Give them hope. In Jesus' name, Jesus' name.